just introducing Minerva. So um, once again, thank you for your interest in this webinar. And today, uh, right now, actually, we're going to have uh, how to talk about your ac accomplishments uh, session with Minerva School, with Alena Savitska from Minerva School at KGI, uh, who is the regional manager, Eastern Europe and Central Asia. So Alena, the floor is yours. Feel free to share your screen and um, talk to our students. I'm sure they will enjoy talking to you as well. Perfect. Thank you very much, Ramila. Uh, one question, would people be able to unmute themselves and uh, jump into the conversation or not? No, it's not allowed, uh, but they can type their questions in Q&A box or in chat box. I will read this out and we will have a chance to uh, respond to all these questions. Also, uh, we have time here for like 45 minutes maximum. So uh, I think we can finalize the presentation within uh, 20, 30 minutes and have time for q and as well. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah, the reason I asked is because I uh, tried to design it a little bit more in an interactive level because this is what we do at Minerva, uh, but I will walk you all through it. So uh, just bear with me um, and hopefully we'll have a fun session because uh, Minerva is the type of, a, and we'll, we'll have a, like a very brief overview of Minerva as well, just to sort of like give you a background and idea. But uh, Minerva is very well equipped to talk about accomplishments, I think, because we, we don't care about your TOEFL. We don't care about your SATs. We're not even test optional. We simply don't care. And we look at other things. And accomplishments is such a big part of, of that process that um, I feel like we're really equipped to do that. So let me start sharing my screen. And um, huh, hold on. This should be available as well. Give me a second. Yes, it is available for you. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, I just, yeah, I didn't see it on my computer. Anyway, so now I can see that. You should be able to see my screen right now. Yes, we do. Okay, perfect. So as I said, my name is Alona. I work with Minerva Schools at KGI as a regional manager for Eastern Europe and Central Asia. I originally am from Kazakhstan. I have lived in, what, seven different countries right now. I'm based in Turkey at the moment. And um, I do come from the region and I feel like I'm definitely the person you can talk to for my job and for my experience. So if you, if you have any questions with regards to Minerva, I would probably be the first person you would want to reach out to to learn a little bit more about Minerva as well. So what is Minerva? Uh, we're a very, very innovative and a rather new university. And what you have to understand about Minerva is the fact that we created like a university from scratch. We took a look at every single aspect of the university experience and we basically questioned it, whether it is how it should be in the 21st century. And again, as a starter, I will give you a small overview of what Minerva is, and then we're gonna go to um, sort of like look more and deeper into the uh, accomplishment section. So talking about Minerva, a couple of things that you have to understand about Minerva is the fact that, well, first of all, we offer a very interconnected curriculum. So the things that you would learn in one class would actually be referenced in another, and then in year two and in year three. And basically your whole process of learning is gonna be very, very interconnected. You would never be studying um, disciplines in isolation. You would be understanding how physics is connected to math, is connected to biology and chemistry and history and all sorts. And you would understand the systems in which uh, issues in the world exist. Uh, another thing that's also important to understand about Minerva is in the fact that we, uh, as a university, do not believe in lectures and we do not believe in tests. We don't have tests when it comes to applying to Minerva and we don't have tests when it, when it comes to studying at Minerva. So instead what we have is a flipped classroom format where all of our students read the material first, then they do the homework. And a lot of that homework actually requires for them to go somewhere outside into the city and um, sort of like do the homework in the city. So they would read about a statistical analysis model uh, at home, then they would go into the city calculate the amount of ATMs in San Francisco using that model. And only after that, they would come into the class and they would learn to uh, use that model even further. And they would talk about their findings. So it's a very active learning instead of just listening to what the professor tells you. 
in terms of the majors and concentrations, you would be able to find all of that information on the website. Um, the only thing that I would want to share here is the fact that we as a university do not just offer you separate disciplines. All of the degrees that we offer are very systematic and very practical. Go into the website, learn more about what we offer in terms of like every single concentration. Uh, one of the most, one of the things that we're most, most famous for is the fact that our students live in seven different countries across the world. So they start in San Francisco and they spend the whole year there. In the second year, they go to Seoul and Hyderabad. In the third year, they go to Berlin, Buenos Aires. In the fourth, they go to London and then Taipei. That is a mandatory program. They have to go to all of those places. And that's that. Uh, in terms of the admissions, as I said, we don't care about TOEFL, we don't care about SATs. So what do we care about? Three parts, uh, the application form, which is basically your transcript, your, uh, the rating of your school, your own rating and uh, contact information. The second part is more of the challenges, which is basically our own evaluation of understanding how you think. We don't want your standardized testing, but we still wanna understand how you think. The difference is that it's impossible to prepare for the challenges. So you will just go, you will just have to go and take them. In the third part, we want to talk about achievements. And again, accomplishments is something extremely important to us. So this is what we want to see. And we'll ask you to mention six different accomplishments. Uh, admissions calendar and admissions date you would be able to see on the website as well. We're open for regular decision one and regular decision right now. And talking about financial aid, we do offer financial aid for everyone. So anyone can apply. It doesn't matter if you're a domestic student or an international student, uh, you would be able to apply and we offer need-based financial aid, which basically means that we'll look at your financial situation. And there's that in terms of the Minerva overview. Now, talking about accomplishments, as I said before, we care a lot about your accomplishments and we really, really want to see um, the the things that you have done and the things that you're proud of. So tip number one, clearly universities are going to be different and clearly universities are going to be looking through for different things, but the universities that pay a lot of attention to accomplishments would most probably want to see three things in your accomplishments and your achievements, impact, competition, and self-learning. Side note, if you're learning English through Skype with a tutor, that is not self-learning. But if you're working as a, a waiter and that you learned some uh, memorizing techniques, or if you have been doing a teamwork and you have learned a specific tool for time management, those are the things that are self-learning. If you're learning, uh, I don't know, Python by yourself from Coursera and then doing something with it, that's also self-learning. But if you're just learning a language or learning a skill with a tutor or learning mathematics with your school tutor, that's not self-learning. That's a side note. But we do look at things from those three lenses. So anytime you write about any accomplishment, look at that accomplishment through these three things and mention the details that will show the impact of that accomplishment, the competition that you have, have had to go through uh, for that accomplishment, and the amount of self-learning specific transferable skills that you uh, got from that particular experience. That is the tip number one. Tip number, ah, the case. So, I'm sorry, I don't know if you can hear that noise, but I've never heard that type of noise in my apartment. I don't know what's happening. But uh, talking about the case. So if you take a look at uh, these three different accomplishments, which, which would you mention in your application? The first one, I won a chemistry Olympiad in the 10th grade. And that's actually true. I actually did win a chemistry Olympiad in the 10th grade when I was back in Kazakhstan. Accomplishment number two, I participated in a clothing drive for the homeless. Accomplishment number three, I organized the first expert visits for my school's debate club and I have been leading that project for a year. Last year, we've invited 30 speakers that trained 350 students in storytelling, project management, and networking uh, from 10 different schools. It is now a countrywide project partially funded by the government. So in the Q&A session, uh, in the Q&A section, could you please type in the, the number that you would, you find as the most impressive accomplishment right now? Or in the chat, yeah, mm -hmm. three. 
One, two, or three. Which one do you think is the most impressive one? Everyone is writing three. Uh, that is actually a very small, hold on. Oops, that wasn't supposed to do that. Uh, that is actually a very small experiment that I usually do with most of my groups because yeah, the majority of people actually uh, put the third one as the most impressive one. Actually talking about all of those accomplishments, all of them can be very impressive. We take a look at the third one because we pay attention to the details and it, the, the, the amount of numbers and the story behind that behind it really helps us understand the context. But winning a chemistry Olympiad in 10th grade can also be a really cool thing. What if you did that on an international level and you did that against 10,000 people? Or what if you had the Olympiad and my case was actually different. I did win the chemistry Olympiad in 10th grade, but I was actually, I, I, I only won that because it was the school level competition in which there were only two people that took part, me and someone else. And the reason that I won is just, I was just a little bit better than that some other person. I wasn't even good at chemistry. I wasn't even that good at chemistry, but because um, the, uh, because of the context, you don't actually understand uh, where I was with that particular Olympiad, but it still can be a really good one if it were an international level, for example. Same goes for the second one. You could have participated in a clothing drive for the homeless, but perhaps by participated, what you meant is that you organized the whole process. You have uh, found a team of 50 people and those 50 people were in charge of different departments and you have been coordinating that project for some time. But uh, you just didn't mention that. So lesson and like tip number two is make sure that you use numbers when you talk about your achievements, because it is extremely important to share that context. And you just have, see, you have just seen that yourself. So make sure that you do talk about the uh, achievements in a, in a way so that people can actually hear you. Include those numbers. If you have been through a specific competition, include the amount of rounds that you had to go through and um, the, the places that you got and how many people competed. Because let me tell you a little secret. Uh, in different countries, Olympiads are done differently. In some countries, you are nominated to the international level or to the national level right away. In our countries, you have to go through seven uh, different, or like, I don't know, like five to seven different stages. You have to start with the school level, then you have to go into the district level, then the city level, then the regional level, and then national level. It doesn't happen in every country. So until you say that, uh, of course, in places like Minerva, where we have 85% international students, of course, we'll know, but not all universities will. So make sure that you include all of those numbers, because you don't want to risk some university interpreting that for you based on what they know. Uh, another thing that I really love, and this comes from my sort of like previous uh, experience, uh, and I used to work in, uh, in large corporations as a recruitment manager. And uh, in a lot of cases, when you don't know how to um, write something in numbers, what you want to do is take a look at the improvement. So the thing, what was happening before you joined that project or you did that thing and what happened after. And whatever percent you can find can be a really good indication of your impact on that particular activity. For example, you have been volunteering at an animal shelter and because of you volunteering, the employees of that animal, ch animal shelter uh, had a chance to free up one hour of their time, uh, of their daily time uh, working in that shelter, which has allowed for, um, I don't know, 20 more dogs to be hosted by that particular shelter. So really think of the consequences of the things that you do and try to measure things is in percentage. Percentage is just a really cool thing to show the progress without um, being able to clearly identify some of the numbers. When you talk about the volunteering uh, project, for example, again, how much was impacted and the, the, uh, the roles that you have led. It is also important to mention what exactly you did because you might have been a part of a project, but um, maybe you haven't really done anything there. Or perhaps 
vice versa, you have had a very significant role, but by saying I participated in that project, you're not going to give us any context. We're never going to be able to understand what your role specifically was there. And uh, another piece of uh, detail that can be helpful there was talking about whether this particular thing has been done before and whether that was a one-time thing. If you have been doing a project repeatedly for the, for, for the past uh, year, that's of course different rather than you doing something for one event for one evening. Uh, tip number three, be holistic. Now, universities are different and universities are looking for different things. So make sure that you really understand the university and you really understand uh, what it is that they're looking for. But for universities that are openly telling you that they want to see you uh, outside of the classroom and they want to see the different things that you have been doing, use that. Um, Minerva is one of those universities. Even if you're interested in psychology, we don't just want to see all of the things you have done in psychology. We want to see your arts. We want to see your sports. We want to see the, I don't know, physics Olympiads that you have been a part of, or I don't know, uh, IT projects that you have been a part of. We want to see all of those different things that really make you who you are. So make sure that you understand what the university is looking for. And if you see that a university is not, and usually the university will tell you right away if they're looking for specific achievements in that particular field. Uh, but if they're not, make sure that you're using all of the different colors in your palette. Case number two, uh, again, why Minerva, right? Like any university is gonna be asking you why us and why you? Uh, and when we're asking you why us, look at the three answers. The first one, Minerva gives need-based financial aid for international students. Second question, why Minerva? Uh, US higher education is highly valued across the world and I do believe that Minerva will open doors to better employment and to further my uh, professional development. And the third one, I'm pursuing a degree in social sciences. I'm fascinated by the cognition, brain, and behavior curriculum and, they, uh, and how it interconnects with the bigger picture in social sciences. I am excited by the fully active learning format and the global immersion component of the Minerva experience. Again, vote. Uh, which one would you uh, use as a response? You can type that into the chat. Uh, which one would you use as a response to that question? Why Minerva? such talented people I have on this session. All right, do we have any more answers? Just wanna make sure that we make it. Uh-huh, three, 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 all, three, uh-huh. Okay, agreed. Uh, agreed in the sense that like, I agree with the, the number three because talking about all of them, uh, the first one, let, let, let's just go one by one. So the first one, uh, yeah, we do give need-based financial aid for international students. But when we ask you why you want to apply to Minerva, we want to see <laughs> something beyond just your interest in uh, looking for financial aid for international students. Clearly, this is something, especially in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, this is something that is very, very valuable to our students. We understand that. We know that we already offer that. Uh, when we ask you why Minerva, what we want to see is the connection that you build between you, your own values, what you're looking for, and what the university can provide. And if your only value is the fact that we offer financial aid, unfortunately, selective universities like Minerva probably that's not going to, not probably, but that's not going to be enough for us. It would show that you probably just went into the website, read the most basic information that you can find, and that's it. Also, there are so many different universities that give financial aid for international students. Again, why specifically Minerva? Uh, talking about the second example, it is a little bit closer, but it doesn't actually answer the question of why Minerva. It answers the question of why U.S. higher education. And that feels like it's a copy paste answer for every single university that you would apply to. The third one clearly talks about Minerva. It clearly talks about why Minerva. And it also shows that you have clicked at least five different tabs on our website that you at, you at least have a basic idea of what we are and who we offer and what we offer uh, as a university. So tip number four, 
please do understand the university. There is about 4,500 plus accredited institutions in the United States. We're all autonomous. We all have our own programs, our own identity, model, and philosophy. And believe you me, we are extremely proud of who we are. We love who we are. We really want to see that recognition in our applicants, especially universities like Minerva. We really want to see that a person, that a student understands what the experience is about. Because your job in the application process, besides just talking about yourself, is showing us that you're a fit. Our job is to see that you're a fit, but your job is to show us that you're a fit. And understanding the university is one of the very good ways where you can show us that you're actually a fit. And for that, make sure that you use different resources. Pick a number of universities that are sort of like your dream schools and not even your dream schools, just like safety schools at any level. And make sure that you're not just going into the website because yes, website can give you the sort of like the overview and the structural information about the university. But websites don't get updated that often. Uh, yes, we update that once a year, but you would never see live updates from a specific university or a specific project that our students have been doing uh, on the website. You would only see some of the highlighted information. So go into things like Facebook and YouTube and Instagram and Medium and just try to Google the university. For example, we just released several articles with the New York Times, The Guardian, uh, Medusa, uh, so many different resources. And we talk about different things. And once you will understand that, for example, last year, Minerva students created the first ever uh, university level hackathon in San Francisco, that can be the example that you can use in terms of uh, explaining why you want to go to Minerva rather than saying, well, you offer international aid for, uh, you, you offer financial aid for international students. Another advice is sign up for the events the university is offering. We're all virtual right now, and I feel like we offer more than ever events at the moment. So reach out to people like me, reach out to just sign up for, I don't know, like newsletters and things like that. There are so many different events that are happening. J join them, learn more about that particular university. I know it's overwhelming, but it's gonna be extremely helpful. Uh, if you have questions, ask them. There's usually students and staff available that is uh, gonna be excited to talk to you. And again, another secret, in some universities, there's people like me that actually get paid to talk to you. Use us as a resource. Uh, and the final one is just understand your needs because again, you can justify you wanting to go to a specific university, but it's going to be so much easier for you to do that once you actually understand what you're looking for, the type of the experience that you're looking for. Because even Minerva, yes, our students live in seven different countries. Yes, they get this very practical degrees where uh, for their homework, they, instead of writing an essay, they go and work in a specific organization. Yes, for their co-curriculars, they uh, go uh, on a boat trip to Antarctica, just like, uh, did, mm, discussing sustainability projects. That is all very, very fancy. That is all very, very cool. But you, until you understand what it is that you need, it's gonna be very hard for you to identify that this university is gonna be for you. Because with, even with all of that coolness that we have as Minerva, we, for example, um, are gonna be very wrong for someone who wants to study theoretical physics for four years or we're gonna be very wrong for someone who will want to uh, stay in one country for all of the four years. We're gonna be, be very wrong for someone who will want to um, have this party student experience. Understand yourself and understand what you're looking for. And that is the final tip that I have. Poof, I made it within 27 minutes. <laughs> I would be very happy to respond to your questions. My information is on the slide. For everyone who registered for the event, you will receive information from, you will receive an email from me as well. And um, my information is gonna be there. If you're looking to contact me earlier, you can go into the website. Um, I am the only Slavic slash Russian speaking uh, name on the website. So it's gonna be very easy to find me and reach out to me if you have any questions. And yeah, let's go back. 
Great, Alien. Thank you very much for this positive, for this energetic uh, presentation. I really like the one uh, you presented. And um, <laughs> I myself want to go to Minerva right now. <laughs> I'm sure students also. <laughs> so yes, um, let's proceed with Q and A's now. And uh, the first question we had here is, um, okay. How many students do you have and how successful are your graduates? Great question. At the moment, we have about 600 students uh, and I'm talking about the undergraduate program. The master, master's program is a bit of a different concept, uh, but talking about the bachelor's program, about 600 students and well, by the time that our students graduated, 96 or 98 percent of them were already employed. I think 96 were already employed and they uh, went into all sorts of different companies. Some st students went into large corporations like Google and Apple and Amazon. Uh, some went into uh, the UN. Some went into some of the other diplomatic missions. Some of the students went into studying into uh, like Harvard Medical School, I think. And someone went into law school, if I'm not mistaken. Some other people opened up their own companies and they attracted a very sizable amount of uh, donations to their um, to their businesses. So our students are doing well. That's all I can say. <laughs> Great, I'm sure with that. So uh, another one is: Do you meet hundred percent of the demonstrated need? Fancy question. Uh, I, I like the fancy wording of that question. But yeah, we do give uh, um, we, we provide uh, need based financial aid. Uh, it will directly depend on your financial situation. However, there are still costs that you should understand that, that are not going to be covered by uh, the financial aid, especially in the first year, because in the second and third year, like because of the way the financial aid is structured, you would actually be able to save up some money. And technically, it's not going to be covered by the financial aid, but you would be able to save up enough to cover those costs. But especially at the beginning, the cost of flights, visas, and health insurance is not going to be covered. So even if you receive maximum financial aid, you would still need to be prepared to have like about $2,000 uh, for the year uh, to, to cover all sorts of various costs. Okay. And... Um... Hi, I know it's kind of off topic, but could you please explain binding enrollment options and if it has any influence on admissions? Oh, I love that question. And thank you so much for asking that. So binding enrollment is an option that you can uh, add for, like th that you can select for any of the cycles. We have three cycles, early action, regular decision one, regular decision two. And for any of those cycles, you can have the binding enrollment option. That means that you apply, like you start your application, you submit your application, and within four weeks, we will uh, tell you whether you are admitted or not. And within 10 days, you would need to make an enrollment. That's not, that's an option that works for some students, which is fine. Uh, and it's usually for the students that don't care that much about their financial aid. In Eastern Europe and Central Asia, that's not a lot of people. So the reason why I'm saying that is because these are the timelines the, that admissions team has signed up for. The admissions team will give you the answer in, within four weeks. You will need to enroll within uh, 10 days. But the financial aid, there is a chance that they will give you that. There is a chance that they wouldn't be able to make it because the financial aid has different timelines. These are two independent offices with independent processes and independent timelines. So if financial aid is important to you, just don't apply binding. Apply as a regular student because you will have longer time to make the enrollment decision. Uh, in terms of it influencing the admission, it doesn't influence admission at all. So the fact that you applied binding does not mean that you will get into Minerva more likely. No, you, you will be processed just like everyone else, just faster. I hope that makes sense. Good, thank you very much. So, and another question, also a good one. I don't think extracurriculars are very big in Georgia, at least not as big as they are in the US. So a lot of the times uh, we just focus on academics. What do students who haven't done that might do to, provo uh, to prove that they are interesting and they can do good? 
how students can prove that if they can't have that opportunities to have more extracurriculars? That's a great question. I'm not sure I can fully agree to that in the sense that, well, first of all, I lived in Georgia for two and a half years. Second of all, we do have Georgian students. So in terms of opportunities for extracurricular activities, uh, I feel like there's a lot of different things that people can do. I've seen people that uh, launched uh, like speech and debate clubs in their cities like Rustavi, for example, and they have uh, made this, that's actually the example that I used was an actual example of a student, like she, she launched the debate club and then it grew into having like all sorts of different events and uh, they had so many guest speakers and then other schools started joining them and things like that. A lot of the volunteering experience and a lot of the extracurricular activities is very self-driven. And even if you don't have uh, specific resources, uh, we are still looking for self-starters. Uh, I know, like I've heard crazy stories. I've heard stories about a student who uh, lived in a remote village where like he didn't even have uh, internet himself, but he would go to this library every single day because the library had internet and he would learn um, uh, some like basics of uh, I think Python or something on Coursera and then he would um, write up some model and then that model would be purchased by a specific organization because it was uh, like effective in solving that particular problem, things are possible. And of course, I understand that with the systems that we have, we're not as, mm, we don't think about extracurriculars that much. Uh, but even with that, I can assure you that there are so many students that are, um, they're just driven to do all sorts of different activities. So even if you don't have, uh, I don't know, like 50 different clubs that you can join, which is actually not that impressive if you just join something that exists. But if you start something by yourself, believe you me, that is going to be a really, really cool thing to prove that um, uh, you're a very interesting candidate. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, another question is, um, actually the question comes from a Georgian student, if I'm not mistaken. So the question is, I'm interested if you ever had students from these three countries, meaning Azerbaijan, uh, Belarus, and Georgia, and you already mentioned you had students from Georgia. So we have students from all, all three of those countries. Oh, great, great, thank you very much. So I apologize if I missed this, but uh, did you say you also have PhD programs? And if so, what are the fields? I'm very sorry for wasting your, I mean, not wasting your time. I, I hope the accomplishments part was still uh, helpful, but in terms of the PhD programs, no, we, we don't offer any PhD programs. Is your acceptance rate really 1% or what do you, what did those people do that 99% doesn't? Uh, what's your criteria? <laughs> I feel like that question is attacking me personally, but uh, yes, the acceptance rate is really, actually, it's a little bit less than 1%. I love and I hate that question. I love that question because it makes me feel really proud of being at Minerva. I hate that question because in a lot of cases, students get very anxious about, uh, you know, like knowing those numbers. Um, the thing about Minerva is that when you apply, you don't actually compete against other people. You compete against the bar. There's a certain standard that you have to mix, uh, that you have to meet. Uh, you either meet that standard and you get into Minerva or you don't meet that standard. The standard is extremely high, but uh, even with the 1% acceptance rate, if 10 people from your school apply and five of those people are your best friends, you shouldn't be worried at all because you're not going to be compared to all of those other people. You will only be compared to the bar. So you shouldn't be anxious, like additionally anxious about that. Uh, <laughs> what do those people do that the other 99% don't? Well, I mean, they are just, I don't know, creme de la creme because we have people like me that are based everywhere in the world. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm responsible for Eastern Europe and Central Asia. We have a person that is responsible for Western Europe, Middle East and Africa, uh, Latin America, South and Southeast Asia and everywhere there is, we're just seeking for the top talented students. Uh, and in terms of the application process, there is still the challenges that you have to take. It's not that we, just because we don't require TOEFL and SAT, it doesn't mean that we're a safety school. 
uh, we have our own evaluation pro process that is actually much, it's much more fun for you, but it's much more demanding in terms of what we demand from a student because it's impossible to prepare for the challenges that we have. Uh, and it's just, it's just not easy to pass those challenges. And we're looking for top students in their countries. We're looking for students that have been doing extremely exciting uh, projects. It's all of those things together. A thing about Minerva is that we have a holistic uh, approach. We're not just looking at one thing when it comes to, um, what's the word? When it comes to reviewing your application, no one thing is gonna be more important than the other. We're gonna be looking at everything together and that's also important. Uh, but yeah, the, um, all of those components are extremely important. Thank you very much. So another question is, can I work on campus beyond studying? If you have financial aid, you will have to work on campus. And if you come from Eastern Europe and Central Asia, you will pro most probably need financial aid. I'm just assuming. Thank you. And um, there is opportunities, but at least from what I see, there isn't a big push for it or um, there isn't a culture for it. I agree. I, I think that's connected with the uh, question with, with uh, the opportunities that uh, like the volunteering and extracurricular opportunities that are available to the students, I agree. Uh, we don't have um, like 50 different volunteering uh, activities like the students in the US do, um, but that is the reality. And that is the reality for everyone. And this is why when you write about your accomplishments, you have to write that information. You have to say that this is the first time that uh, that type of an activity has been launched in my city, in my country. This is the first time we're initiating something like this because these details matter. Just because you don't have something is not gonna be an excuse enough specifically for Minerva for, for us to uh, just accept you based on your grades. Like clearly that's not gonna be enough. Uh, but this is exactly why you need to write your story, because if you don't write that story, my colleagues are extremely talented and extremely amazing. And I'm sure that people in other universities are as well. But if you don't write the context and the additional details about your accomplishments, you run, you run, um, there's a chance that people will just assume that it's just like in any other country. And it's not. So this is why we had this session today. This is why I told you to write about the context. Thank you very much. So uh, this one from Nadia uh, from Georgia is not a question, but the, just a uh, comment. You didn't waste my time. It was great to listen to you and thanks for helpful information. And the next one is a question. I have some accomplishments, but I cannot choose. Would it be okay if I shared those with you personally so you could can they help me? Actually, if you're applying to Minerva, absolutely. I support all of the applicants that are Minerva applicants, and I'm very happy to review a list of their accomplishments once they start their application. Another thing that I'm doing for all of the applicants is uh, before the, app the application deadline for each of the cycles, I am having uh, a separate session where it's just the Minerva applicants. And we take a look at, we have a similar presentation, but we take a look at each of the accomplishments that the students can write individually. And we discuss those in groups. So there's so many different examples at which we look and um, I just give a lot more additional information. So if you are a Minerva applicant, you will, and if you're a Minerva applicant for regular decision one specifically, you will receive an invitation from me somewhere around December uh, where we'll have like a two hour session looking at all of those different things. Great, thank you. And there is another question in the chat box. So hello, thank you for the excellent presentation. How e effective would it be to be a founder of youth charity movement that unifies students all around the city? That's a good question. Anything can be effective. Anything can be an impressive accomplishment as long as you provide details. Uh, if you have unified 10 students across the world, that is still really cool, don't get me in the wrong way, but uh, that is a, um, like once you start showing that uh, it was not 10 students, it was 10,000 students, those 
accomplishments will have a different value. So it's all about the context. Provide numbers so that people can actually understand what it is that you're talking about. Just saying that I have founded this organization and it connects, con connects people is not going to be enough for us to determine that. Uh, and again, anything can be a, a really great accomplishment. It's all about the details. Uh, and there is another question, which is almost the same one. Uh, which activities are commonly underlined by universities in essay or in application? It's a good question. And I feel like Education USA is more equipped to answer that because that's a general question about a lot of universities. I mean, we don't even have essays, so I don't know. Uh, I know that a lot of people from our region talk about Olympiads simply because that, that, that's just a very common thing to do. Uh, but in terms of like the common ones, I don't even know. Again, like for us, it doesn't matter what it is, what is common, what is not common, what is popular, what is not popular. We want to, you to share the things that you're proud of, and that can be absolutely anything. And we will read about every single thing, and we will value every single accomplishment that you mentioned. It doesn't like, please don't think that one, like an Olympiad can be cooler than a volunteering project, or I don't know, like the fact that I uh, wrote, uh, like that I created a website is cooler than the fact that I drew a painting that was a part of uh, a specific foundation, and then we got a fundraising um, activity out of it. One is not cooler than the other. I hope that's exactly. Cool. Thank you very much for covering this. Uh, and as Education USA advisors during our webinars on essay writings or um, completing the application, so we always advise students to uh, highlight all, uh, mostly about all the uh, extracurricular activities, all their skills and abilities they have, so that um, uh, to, to present themselves in their essays completely to the university representatives and to let the university representative know more about the student before they come to the university. So exactly, and uh, uh, students can also uh, participate in more uh, kind of webinars in the future with Education USA offices in their countries, and uh, particularly with the current situation, um, the, all the Education USA offices uh, host more and more. Uh, U.S. University representatives for those webinars and um, all these questions and uh, more questions can be covered uh, at those uh, webinars as well. So with that, I would like to thank you very much to Alena first and to all the attendees for the great questions for the webinar you presented. So um, actually, we have just 15 minutes left until the end of this today's big fair. So I would like to give the last chance to all our students to go back to the university booth and to chat uh, to, with the university rep representatives and not to lose the last 15 minutes and to get more and more details from university representatives regarding that, those kind of specific uh, questions they had. I completely support. Good luck, everyone. Thank you very much and good luck to all the attendees and uh, thank you to all the university representatives for attending the fair today and uh, for providing such a uh, wide and uh, great information, useful information to all our students. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a nice day.